Thank you for joining us for another lesson from God's Word. The Streetsboro Church of Christ is located at 1386 Russell Drive, Streetsboro, Ohio, 44241. If you're ever in the area, we hope that you'll stop in and worship with us. We hope that you'll enjoy this lesson brought to you by our minister, Ralph Price. A recipe is a list of ingredients with certain instructions on how to put those ingredients together to obtain the desired dish, the desired food that you want to eat. Last week we noticed a recipe for failure in our study of the children of Israel. As God had brought them out of the land of Egypt under the leadership of, of Moses, and they've come to the border of the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And God has them send, has Moses send 12 spies into the promised land and um, spy it out. And I believe, as I said last week, this was really a test on his part for the children of Israel. And those spies come back and 10 of those spies report that this is just not possible. This land is well fortified. There are giants in the land. We cannot take it. Joshua, Joshua and uh, Caleb, on the other hand, said, no, we can take it. But the people chose to listen to the ten spies and not to Joshua and Caleb. And we notice then, as a result, that they failed. That generation failed to enter into the promised land. And those ingredients that we looked at last week. We talked about a spirit of pessimism on their behalf. The idea of always looking at the negative and not thinking about the positive. And one thing I neglected to mention last week is these, these points that I dealt with, they really sort of build on one another. But uh, that spirit of pessimism then often leads to self-pity, uh, which they began to feel. And woe is me, you know, you know, why has God brought us out here to kill us, and we should probably just go back, and so, you know, that led to complaining on their behalf, and then looking back and wanting to go back into Egypt, that was another ingredient, and then they had this, they began to be rebellious, they decided they were going to replace Moses, and then finally, they're described as lacking faith in God. And so all of those qualities, if you want to fail as a Christian, possess those qualities. Make those qualities part of your life and you then will not enter into your spiritual promised land, which is heaven. What I want to do today, though, as promised, is I want to uh, look at a recipe for success. And we're going to be looking at Joshua and Caleb and the characteristics, the qualities that they possessed in this in this passage, in this narrative, that uh, had the children of Israel chose to heed them, they would have succeeded uh, in their quest to enter into the promised land. And so point number one is the opposite of point number one last week. Recipe for failure was they had a spirit of pessimism. This week, we notice that Joshua and Caleb had an optimistic attitude. Just the opposite of pessimism. If you notice in Numbers 13 and verse 30, it says, Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. He was an individual who, even though he realized that there were certain obstacles there in the land, and that it, you know, it, it may be difficult, it, May not, but he says we're well able. You know, it's not like we're just going to scrape by and a lot of us are going to die. He says we're well able to overcome it. And so he sees the good. He keeps a positive attitude. God said in regard to Caleb and uh, Joshua that, that they had a different spirit. In chapter 14 of Numbers and verse 24, in regard to Caleb, God says he has a different spirit in him. And has followed me fully. I will bring him into the land where he went. And his descendants shall inherit it. So whereas. The people in general had a very pessimistic attitude. Both Joshua and Caleb. Had an optimistic attitude. 
Um, they saw opportunities when they went into the promised land, whereas the other ten spies only saw the obstacles uh, that were there. And so we ask ourselves, when, when we are faced with a decision, when we are faced with uh, obstacles in our life, do we focus in on those obstacles or do we focus in on the opportunities that are available for us? Winston Churchill once said, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, whereas an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. And it really comes down to how we want to look at things. As we think about the Apostle Paul, we realize that he was an optimist. And, you know, if ever there were a person uh, who walked this earth besides Jesus, who, who may have had a reason to doubt people, a reason to have a pessimistic attitude when it came to fellow human beings, it would be Paul. And yet we see in Paul that he had an optimistic attitude both about his brethren and about his work, the work that God had set for him to do. For example, in Philippians 1 and verse 6, Paul here says to the Philippians, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. What's he saying there? He's saying, I have faith in you, brethren. I, I believe that, that you're going to stay faithful, that you're going to do the will of God. Do we have that type of attitude with our brethren? Do we try to keep an optimistic attitude? And while we realize that our brethren are not perfect, they have faults and failures, and we have faults and failures, are we trying to look for the good and are we hoping for and actually expecting the best from our brothers and sisters in Christ? And certainly Paul did and we should as well. Even though many times his brothers and sisters didn't live up to his expectations and hopes, he, re he continued to have an optimistic attitude in regard to them. And what about his work? You know, as we think about the Apostle Paul's work, there were many downs, there were many lows uh, in his work, including, of course, toward the end of his life as he's arrested and carried to Rome. And he writes the book of Philippians while in prison in Rome. And in verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 12 to 19, listen to what he says. He says, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. There's an optimistic attitude. He's been arrested, he's in prison, he's in Caesar's palace at this point, and he says, I want you to realize that it's okay. The things that have happened have actually had some positive uh, outcomes, some good results. What are those results, Paul? He says, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. He says, number one, those whom I'm, who surround me realize that the only reason I'm here is because I'm a faithful servant, of Jesus Christ. They realize he's not guilty of anything that is worthy of having him there. Going on, and most of the brethren in the Lord have become confident by my chains and much more bold to speak the word without fear. He says, another positive consequence of my being in this situation is my brothers are, are more bold, bold. They see my confidence, they see my optimistic attitude, and it helps to make them more bold and less fearful. Uh, in their service to the Lord. And he goes on now and says, Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from good goodwill. The former, he's talking about the ones who preach Christ from envy and strife, preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my change, but chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. And notice again now in verse 18, he says, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. So he says, some preach Christ out of envy and strife and some out of goodwill. And what's he getting at there? I believe what Paul's alluding to is that many were preaching Christ in their attempt to have Paul arrested and persecuted. In other words, they were saying things like Paul preaches about Christ and that Christ rose from the dead and that Christ taught this and taught that. And in doing that, they were trying to bring, add chains to his affliction to make his life worse. But Paul again chose to have a positive attitude and he says, I don't care. I don't care why they're doing it, whether they're doing it out of pretense or sincerely, they are telling the people about Jesus. 
He's looking for the good uh, that can come out of every situation. And he says in verse 19, I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So optimistic attitude. Paul had it. Joshua and Caleb had it there. We think about David. You know, David, again, is another man who made many mistakes, had many ups and downs in his walk with God. But David was optimistic. Uh, when we have in 1 Samuel chapter 17 the account of, of David and Goliath, uh, how that giant had come out, the Philistine Goliath, and taunted God's people day after day, and nobody was willing to go out and, and to fight Goliath. And David says to King Saul there in 1 Samuel 17, 32, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistines. Let no man's heart fail. In other words, don't, don't you worry about it. Um, I'll go out and face him. And if you read on, David acknowledged, you know, God's going to take care of me. There's no need for me to even worry about this. Optimism is an absolutely important ingredient, I believe, in our desire to reach our promised land, which is heaven. However, you know, optimism alone won't do it. It takes more than one ingredient. In John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5, Jesus made this statement. He says, abide in me and I in you. Notice, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Optimism alone will not get us to heaven. Jesus says, and, and the scriptures teach, that we need to have a positive attitude. But in order for us to bear fruit to God, we have to abide in him. And of course, abiding in him means obeying his will and doing his will. And so it's an important ingredient, but that in and of itself is not going to make the dish that we're looking for, which is salvation from our sins. Number two. Not only do we need an opti optimistic attitude, but again, like Joshua and like Caleb, we need to wholly follow the Lord. In Joshua 14, again, as Joshua is looking back on his life and recounting some of the things that happened, he says, uh, Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenazite said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God concerning you and me and Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I, Caleb says, I wholly followed the Lord my God. The idea of wholly following God. There are many in this world today who claim and who, who do follow the Lord to a certain extent, but they only follow him as far as they're willing to go. They don't wholly follow the Lord. To follow the Lord wholly or completely, we need to follow him wherever he leads. In Revelation chapter 14 and uh, verses 1 through 4, John is given a vision of heaven. And uh, we read there, he says, I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000. You heard a lot, hear a lot about this, 144,000. I believe it's representative of all the saved, both of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And I have reasons to believe that, but we're not going to go into that. But we have 144,000, all the saved, um, throughout history, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters and like the voice of a loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb, notice, wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. We have to acknowledge and realize that, yes, there are wonderful blessings await those who follow the Lord, but we 
have to be willing to follow him wherever that wherever he leads us in that there may be times when we are led into certain situations into certain things certain problems where maybe we're a little bit uncomfortable but we have to continue to follow him jesus may lead us in ways that are not pleasing to our friends there may be times when we have to tell our friends no i can't do that with you that is not what i should be doing as a christian and let me suggest, if you find yourself having to do that on a regular basis, think about looking for new friends. But we're warned about this in 1 Peter 4 and verse 4. In regard to these, they, the world, think it strange that you, the Christian, do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. Sometimes in order to wholly follow the Lord, we're going to have to not follow the world, our friends. There are times when following Jesus may mean that we can't go in the way that might please our family. We have to come to the understanding that Jesus is to be our number one priority. We're going to follow him, even if in so doing I might go against my family. Matthew 10, 34 to 38. And again, in many ways in, the, in our country, um, we're blessed in that most times parents are fairly um, willing to let their children go and do what they believe is right. But I know of instances where people have obeyed the gospel and as a result have been shunned by their families uh, in doing that. But Jesus tells us in Matthew 10, 34 to 38, Do not think I've come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me this is i think one of the most difficult sayings of jesus in all of scripture first of all the idea i didn't come to bring peace but a sword on the earth what was he saying i thought he was the prince of peace well he is but the peace he offers is not necessarily here on earth the peace that he offers is between god and man and with self, he gives us peace within ourselves. But his teachings, because there are so many who will not follow him and many who stand against him, his, his teachings will bring division on the earth. That's what he's warning us about here. And he's warning us that even among our own family members, there may be this division. And who are you going to follow? Are you going to follow Jesus or are you going to follow mom and dad? Are you going to obey the one who died for your sins that you might have eternal life? Or are you going to die in your sins because you're following the one who brought you into this world? And we have to learn to put God first. Will we wholly follow the Lord? Now, if not, we have the freedom not to. And if we choose not to, then I think we fall into the category of Matthew 7, 21 to 23 there. Of those who follow the Lord to some extent... But not all the way. Because in this passage, Jesus is talking about people who say they had prophesied in his name and cast out demons in his name. And yet he says to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. They had perhaps followed the Lord to a certain extent, but they hadn't wholly followed the Lord. And as a result, Jesus says to them, uh, Depart from me, I never knew you. So... Number two, we need to also wholly follow the Lord. We need to have an optimistic attitude. We need to wholly follow the Lord. And then for number three, look at Numbers 14, 5, and 6. Here, again, Joe read this for us. It says that Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua, and the, uh, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes they tore their clothes and so number three we need passion passion for the cause you know one thing i i've noticed a lot about younger people is that 
um, from church camp and things of that nature. I'm not thinking of necessarily anyone here, but uh, many young people have an attitude of whatever. You know, if you want to, if you want to uh, be a Christian and go to church on, you know, three times a week, four times a week, that's great. But if you don't, whatever. You want to believe in God? Great. If you don't, whatever. But I see here that when the ten spies gave the evil report and the two spies gave the good and Joshua and Caleb saw that the multitude was following those evil spies, the ones who gave the bad report, it bothered them. It bothered them greatly to the point that they tore their clothes. And so again, we ask ourselves, how much zeal, how much passion do we possess how much does it bother us to realize that there are individuals around us, there are friends and family members who are, are going to be lost if they do not change? They had a passion for the cause. And we think about that idea and we realize that sometimes passion can be misguided. The Apostle Paul, again, we're talking about him a lot, but the Apostle Paul had passion all his life. Before he was a Christian and after he was a Christian, Paul, no matter what he was involved in, he did it with all of his might. He describes uh, his misguided passion in Acts chapter 26, 9 through 11. Not going to read all that but right now, but he talks about how he was exceedingly enraged against Christians and how he had them put to death and he cast his vote against them. He, he really, truly believed that he was doing God's will and he had a passion for that. It was misguided. There's a warning in that for us as well. Passion is great, but it's got to be a passion and a zeal according to knowledge. And his wasn't according to knowledge at this point. But nevertheless, when Paul eventually was taught and learned the error of his ways and became a Christian, he again um, went into that ministry with the same zeal. In Acts chapter 14, uh, beginning of verse 19, says, Then the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul. Okay, so we're here at Lystra now in this passage, and Jews had come from towns where he had been, and they find Paul, and they stone him. And it says that they drag him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Now, stoning was not something that people survived, okay? And there actually is a lot of discussion about whether he really did die or not. And maybe God brought him back. It doesn't say. But he was in bad enough condition that they thought he was dead. And they drug him out of the city and left him by the side of the road. But it says then that, you know, uh, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up, went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to, Der um, uh, to Derby. But what we see there is a zeal in Paul in that Again, he didn't allow the stoning to stop him, okay? He, not only does he get up, and, and again, if I were stoned in a city and I woke up, I'd probably head the other direction, but I wouldn't go back into the city. But Paul goes back into the city where he had just been stoned. And so we see a zeal in Paul continually and, and uh, a mentality of Paul that uh, he didn't care what you did to him. If you killed him, he got to go to heaven. And we need to have that same mentality. In Titus chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, we read, Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. The idea of being zealous for good works, does that term describe us? Does it describe you as an individual and us as a congregation? Um, looking for opportunities to do good. Looking for um, ways that we can glorify God and grow and become stronger as Christians. We need that type of passion. That type of zeal. 1 John 4 and verse 19 gives us motivation. We love him because he first loved us. And that, that motivation, we love him because he first loved us, that's really what drove Paul as well. Um, as you look again at the life of Paul and his writings with Timothy, he, he talks about the great love that God had shown him, um, even though he formerly had been a blasphemer. 
In 1 Timothy 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses 12 to 16, he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ came into the world that to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. And so we have in Paul great zeal because he realized just how bad he had been, and yet God still was willing to forgive him. God still was willing to use him in his service. Now, Paul had to choose to obey, uh, and he did. He had to turn his back on his former life, and he did. But as a result, um, he has the promise of eternal life. Okay, we need to get moving here. I feel like uh, I'm going on forever. Number four, though. We need to learn to depend on and trust in God. Numbers 14, 7 through 9. Um, <clears throat> again, it says, They spoke to the congregation of the children of Israel. This, these are the, uh, Joshua and Caleb. The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. And notice, he says, If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us, and the land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them. The Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And so the message of Joshua and the message of Caleb was, uh, number one, if the Lord delights in us, he'll bring us into the land. In other words, it doesn't matter how hard it appears it's going to be about the obstacles. If God promised us the land, if we obey him and don't rebel against him, he's going to give it to us. And uh, I, I love the way he just says, they are our bread. And to me, that's, that, that's his way of saying, we're going to eat them, eat them alive. We're going to, you know, if God is with us, they cannot stop us. Um, we're going to plow right through them for their protection has departed. Um, today for us as well, our success depends upon God. You know, ultimately it's God who gives the increase in all things that we do. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 6, Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God is the one who gave the increase. We always like to see the increase, and we feel good about the increase when we maybe talk with people, study the Bible with them, and they obey the gospel. But really, the, the obedience and, and the, the, the beauty of that comes from God, not us. We're just the messenger who reveals the message. Colossians 2 and verse 19, Paul says, um, that some who are unfaithful, not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. Our increase, our growth, comes from God. And then in 2 Corinthians 3, verses 4 and 5, there at the end of verse 5, Paul says our sufficiency is from God. And so we need to learn to depend and to trust our God, there are many things that we may put our mind to, things that we want to accomplish that might seem too difficult. But if we put our trust in God, then we can accomplish them. Well, you know, why can't we be a congregation of 200 people? Why can't we uh, grow and, and, and uh, reach out into this community and, and be able to help all kinds of people even more than we're doing right now? We need to learn to trust in God. We need to trust Him to fulfill His promises. We know that that's part of faith, Hebrews 11 and verse 6. We must believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We must trust him to keep his promises. And those promises are things like salvation. Those promises are things like he will answer our prayers in the way that is best. That the uh, promises are heaven and the hope of heaven that we have. The spiritual blessings that are found in Christ. And the ability to overcome or escape from trials. Uh, in our life. All of these things are promises that God has made for us if we trust in him. And then finally, number five, um, I have I've made up a word here, and if you wanted a, a real word, you could talk about perseverance. I call it stick to itiveness stick to itiveness and that is the idea <clears throat> that they stuck to it. 
Uh, in regard to Joshua and Caleb, verses 36 to 38 of Numbers 14, the men who Moses sent to spy out the land who returned and made all the congregation complain against him by bringing um, a bad report of the land, those very men who brought the evil report about the land died by the plague before the Lord, but Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh remained alive of the men who went to spy out the land. They remained alive, and, and the uh, implication and what we see from their life is that not only did they remain alive, they remained faithful uh, in their service to the Lord. Um, yes, we need to be optimistic. We need to have all these characteristics in our lives, but if we don't stick to it, all of our lives, if we only are faithful for a short time and then fall away, then that does us no good in the long run. It will not benefit us. We, we have to stick to it in our good works. Galatians 6 and verse 9. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. We must learn to stick, stick to it in prayer. Um, Luke 18 and verse 1. Jesus taught a parable that men ought always to pray and not lose heart. And he, he gives a parable there to teach that. And so he wants us to stick to it in prayer. And, and just the idea of sticking to it in our Christian walk in general is it, taught in numerous places. In Revelation 2 and verse 10, we have here Jesus saying, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. That you may be tested, you will have tribulation ten days. But now he basically says, stick to it. He says, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Stick to it. Possess all of these characteristics. Have an optimistic attitude. Look for the opportunities and don't focus in on the obstacles. Certainly acknowledge them, but look for the opportunities and how to get around those obstacles. Wholly follow the Lord. Go where he leads, wherever that may be even if it goes against what your friends want or what your family wants. Have a passion for the cause. Don't have a whatever attitude. Let it bother you that people are going to be lost. And have a passion for the cause in trying to bring people to Christ. Have a passion in your own life to grow and become the Christian that God wants you to be. Learn to depend and trust on God in order to do those things and then stick to it until the end. And then... That's a recipe for success. You'll have the promised land uh, that awaits us, which is heaven itself. As we conclude this lesson, um, I realize I'm talking mostly to Christians this morning. Uh, maybe you've not stuck to it. Maybe you've, you've done all these things and you've tried to do what's right, but you've fallen. And, and you're not living the way that a Christian ought to live any longer. Uh, we offer you the opportunity. God offers you the opportunity to repent of the sin in your life. Recommit your life to him and he'll forgive you of the sins that you've committed. Um, but maybe there are some here who have not yet become a Christian. We want to offer you that opportunity. If you believe that Jesus is the son of God and, and you trust him and you, and you want to do his will so that you can have heaven when this life is over, then turn or repent from your sins. Confess your faith and be baptized or immersed as Jesus commanded and you can have salvation again. And then have the fortitude to stick to it till the end. As we sing this song that, uh, that has been chosen. If there are any who need to respond. We offer you the opportunity to do that. As we stand and as we sing. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments. Ralph can be reached at rprice at streetsboroughchurch.org. Or by calling 330-626-4282. If you would like to learn more about the Church of Christ, we offer free Bible correspondence courses by mail and home Bible studies. We hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Feel free to come visit us. We would love to have the opportunity to meet you.